Welcome to WWGOA Live. It's uh, Wednesday, March 15th here in uh, scenic Hammond, Wisconsin. If you can, uh, March 16th, yeah, I'm getting the date wrong. Um, if there's any background noise, it's because it's blowing a gale outside. Uh, so you may hear that blowing by the building here every once in a while. We're going to get to a bunch of questions here tonight. I'm going to remind you of one thing. We're giving away an Erlex sprayer on Facebook. We talked about this last time. The giveaway is tomorrow. So you've got very little time to get on WWDOA Facebook page. You'll see the sweepstakes for the Ehrlich sprayer right there. Um, be there or be square. We're going to go for a record number of questions. Krista, fire at will. Okay. Um, our first question comes from Rob. Rob would like to know what books or videos you recommend that would give him a start to finish instructions on making rustic furniture. With all the ash wood becoming available, this might be a good way to recycle it. All right, great question, Rob. So if you're not familiar, uh, ash trees are being cut down because of the emerald ash borer. Um, cities are just summarily, preemptively taking trees down, even if they're not diseased yet. Ash would be a great wood to use for rustic furniture. Um, there was a guy, when I was running the American Woodworker shows a bunch of years ago, Daniel Mack, M-A-C-K is the guy's name, and he had a book, I, I think it was just called uh, Making Rustic Furniture, or very similar, but certainly if you Google his name, Daniel Mack, you're going to find him, you're going to find the book. Uh, nice guy, good instructor, good textbook, um, that'll get you started. Thank you very much, George. All right, so our next question, um, it comes from Al. He wants to know two things. One, can you use or mix dye into stain to add a little color to the stain? And two, are there instances when you should precede dye with a sealer, like on pine? Okay, um, so can you mix dye? So I'm assuming we're talking about aniline dye. Let's get, let's do a couple things, Krista. Um, let's, we don't have the assistant George or Ginny with us again tonight. Um, you want me to just run? Or you can go get it if you want. So in the big black cabinet, if you open the top section, there is um, right immediately on your left, right at eye level, there are some tiny little bottles, kind of funny looking. Any one of those would be, yep. Oh no, no. Um, you're close though. Uh, they look like little glue bottles though. Um, They're definitely on the left side of the cabinet. Um, there's like six of them in a row. Maybe go look in the lower section. Maybe I misdirected you. Open the bottom doors, maybe. Okay, they were in the bottom section, not the top section. So much for my wonderful memory. Aniline dye is an amazing thing. If you've not tried it and you're finishing, you should. Um, this is an example of it. I'm gonna put it on the table so Krista can get in there and you can get a close look at it. Um, you can mix aniline dyes with water. You can mix them with denatured alcohol. You can mix them right into a top coat. They're available in about a gazillion different colors. It's a great way to tone your wood. Can you mix this with stain? Um, I sure think so um, because you can mix it with pretty much anything. So it would let you create subtle changes in your uh, stain color. If there's any doubt in your mind, um, if it's a Minwax stain, get the Minwax customer service number, give them a jingle and ask, you know, ask them about compatibility. But I sure think you could do that. Next part of that is um, pre-treating wood like pine prior to using a dye or a stain. So let me, I'm gonna walk this way. Um, and then I'm going to, um, I'm just gonna run to the finishing cabin. I'm gonna come right back. Literally run. I'm going to get a little stain, I don't care what color, and I'm going to get a rag and we're going to come back because this is a pretty cool thing. So the next question, should I pre-finish woods, especially woods like pine, before putting a stain on? And the answer is yes. I'm still coming back. I need something to open the can with. Okay. 
Certain woods have this prevalence for being, or, uh, or a predisposition to getting blotchy under finish. Pine is one, birch, maple. Um, this is a chunk of pine, um, and my son and I were doing some finishing experiments the other day, so that's why this is here. And can you see it? Is there? Can you see a color tone difference on it, Krista? It might be too subtle for um, the camera. I think if you put it down, I can see it. If you, yeah, now you can kind so of the, see it. So the top you might notice is darker than the bottom. What happened here is this has got a coat of de-wax shellac from here up. This is still raw wood. So the reason I got the stain is I think if uh, I slap a little color on this, you're going to see the benefit to pre-sealing. Could I have found a bigger screwdriver to open a stain can with? All right. Now, what's when I wipe this, Krista, what do you like on board angle here? If you can really see this section, that's the transition yeah. right there. Okay. Go ahead. That's perfect. So it's a coat of shellac and then just slightly sanded with about a 220 grit paper. And you can see already without me even wiping the excess off the difference in application. Uh, go a little further here, wipe off the excess. And it creates a color difference. It creates a uniformity of color difference. It's really a good way to go to make sure that on woods like pine, maple, birch, when you're gonna stain them, uh, they end up being less blotchy. If you've ever noticed that when you stain end grain, it stains a lot darker than the rest of the wood. Put a little de-wax shellac on there first, then stain over the de-wax shellac, and um, you're going to get much more uniform color. Particular brand of that is Zinzer Seal Coat. Um, most home centers sell it. Chris is going to go get a can so we can see it. The really important thing here is that it's de-waxed. If the shellac has got wax in it, um, other finishes are not going to want to stick to it and uh, George and I were just finishing his project with it, so it might not have got put away back in the right spot. Oh, well. Zinzer. Zinzer, Z-I-N-S-S-E-R, Seal Coat. Seal Coat is a product, and um, I'm going to solicit a couple things here. One, don't forget Erlex Sprayer giveaway, WWGOA Facebook page. That you got to get there soon. Don't leave the live, but you got to get there soon because the giveaway is tomorrow. Um, also, um, give us a read here on uh, audio and video quality. We made some changes. We'd love to know if they're having an effect. And then three, uh, let us know, please, where you're watching from. Krista, might you have a question we can answer? I do have a question. I have a lot of questions. Um, do you have any related to woodworking? Yeah, I have some related to woodwork. Okay. Some of them actually aren't, but that's okay. Um, David wants to know, when making a game, how do you cut marble poles? Well, I've lost all my marbles, so I really don't know. Um, let me get a thing. I think you can stay here, Krista, and I will be, I'm going to leave the camera. This is the problem with not having an assistant, one of the kids here. That's okay. While, Keep talking. while George is running off to get something, whatever, just a reminder that we are here with George Von Driska, the managing editor for Woodworkers Guild of America. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you can do that by going out to www.goa.com. Look at perfect. Perfect, great timing. All right, I'm going to ask you to do a a, a nice little zoomy zoom zoom. We're going to zoom 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 a zoom. Very nice. Here's what I've got. You might already be familiar with what are called self-centering bits. I like to call them egotistical bits because they're self-centered. The self <laughs> Don't give me this thing, Kai. I'm I think telling I'm, you, you have I, that disease. I think I'm very funny. Um, self-centering bits have an outer gizmo here, and then the bit itself is in the middle. And these are available in different sizes. I use them all the time to put hardware on cabinets, not this particular one. This one I got from Rockler, and it's specifically for marble. So do you think you can see the profile here, Krista? It's, it's a little, okay, it's a little half round, quite a spring on there. It's hard to hold down. So it's designed to be half the, what would that be? It's designed to be the radius of a marble. So in this case, this is a tic-tac-toe template. This 
shoulder goes into the template. Then I would clamp this in place to make sure there wasn't slippage. And it's going to be subtle, and I'm sure Krista can get it. So here, what that gives us are little half rounds that are just the right size for a marble to nest in. So if you want to do tic-tac-toe, you can buy the template from Rockler as well. If you just want to do marbles, you can get the bit, and then you can make your own template to work with that drill bit. Perfect. That was kind of a boring question. You know what? People are commenting about how they love your jokes. Thank you. Wait, Except. and how you don't leave any time for laughter. You know why he doesn't leave any time for laughter, guys? Because everybody rolls his eyes. Uh, everybody rolls their eyes at him because the, these jokes are all the time. They're so rarely. They're so, you you got to stay to the end because at the end of tonight, I'm going to say my favorite St. Oh, Patrick's Day joke. Okay. All right. Steve. 759 Central Park. Steve wants to know what is an easy, user friendly, CAD program for woodworking, or is it CAD? CAD, okay. Computer Aided Designs. Okay. So CAD is, is the acronym for Computer Aided Design. And boy, it's it's hard to beat SketchUp. Uh, SketchUp is a Google product, and uh, it's got a really good price tag. It's free. Um, you can download it. It's I don't use it a lot, but I'm teaching myself to do so. One of our authors, David Radke, is a very big user of SketchUp, Paul Mayer. And um, we just produced a class on this, which is currently, it was just recently posted. It is available as an online class. So you can download SketchUp for free, um, work through the tutorials, work through the class. It's incredible, incredible how powerful it is for being free. Thank you. Um, Chuck wants to know, George, what is the easiest way to set up locking miter router bits? Say that three times fast. Set up locking miter router bits. Don't. Um, okay, here is the challenge. Um, if you, Krista, want to, between those two white cabinets, um, there are two plastic bins that are full of sample joints. And if you could bring, yeah, we'll take a chance that stuff is in there. Um, so the lock miter bits are really cool. They provide a mechanical grab. They provide a lot of glue surface area. Thank you very nice. The downside is we, you do the work on a router table, and the downside is that they can be really, really dicey to set up. So we got lucky here. There's part of a lock miter and part of a lock miter. Good job. So the way that it works when the joint goes together, where would you like me to? Right here. Okay. The way it works when the joint goes together, if I grab the right pieces here, is this piece interlocks into this piece. You can see it creates a tongue and groove interlock. A lot of mechanical strength here, a lot of room for glue. When it closes on a well-made joint, we close on a miter out here so you can't see any part of the joint on the outside. The downside is pulling your hair out to get these set up on a router table. Um, the technique I use for this is one where we only work in one plane at a time. What happens when you machine these pieces is one piece gets fed this way, flat ways on the router table. The mating piece gets fed against the fence. If you start right out of the chute, cutting both pieces like that, one flat, one against the fence, it's really hard to figure out where your setup is wrong. Is it the bit height? Is it the fence position? Is it both? So the technique I use has us start with piece being fed flat, another piece being fed flat. Let's see if this will work. And then we flip them and put them together to see if they're level across the top. That's going to tell you if the bit is the right height. Once you know that they're level across the top, then we can start positioning the fence so that we can feed a piece this way to get the interlocking joint. It's hard to describe this. We, we've got a video on this on WWGOA, um, which I'm pretty sure is just called Cutting Lock Miters. Um, and it'd be worth having a look at if this is a joint that you want to use. It's much easier to show than it is to talk through it. Um, 
in, in a bigger process than we could do it alive because um, it would take about 15 minutes probably to get through that so okay thanks very much George. so richard would like to know how do you sharpen lay tools and do you have a specific tool that you use to rough out wood on the lay okay um you stay where you is and i'm gonna bring stuff so, uh, lathe chisels, um, if I can talk and move stuff at the same time, lathe chisels are something you've got to learn to sharpen on your own. Unlike other tools in your shop that you might send out, router bits, joiner knives, planer knives, table saw blades, lathe chisels you've got to sharpen on your own. I'm going to come to this side of the table because there's power and you'll be able to see. Go ahead. Yep. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's look at, um, the technique is gonna be the same, but we'll use two different machines here. This machine is a work sharp and at this point in my turning, I do all of my sharpening freehand. And I encourage my students when I do turning classes to also learn to do freehand sharpening because it's so fast. So the downside to it is there's a learning curve. You got to get the mechanical, you got to get the muscle memory to do this. But the way I would sharpen uh, a few sample chisels here, here's a spindle gouge. On the work sharp, it's got this glass disc, which is covered with a self-adhesive sandpaper, what I'm going to do is simply roll the bevel of the chisel across that abrasive. Now there's good news and there's bad news. I didn't have to set up any jig. I didn't have to mess with that angle. The bad news is if I don't do this correctly, in other words, if the handle's too high or the handle's too low, I could mess up the bevel on my chisel. That's the muscle memory part. You've got to find this angle where the bevel is flat. As we make the cut, it's really important that you keep it moving. We don't want to do sharpen, 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 because you're going to get facets on there. We want to do sharpen, roll through, sharpen, roll through. That's a spindle gouge. This is a spindle roughing gouge. It's going to look very much the same. On a skew, it's a big flat surface. That would simply get set flat on that disc. Flip it. Making sure I'm keeping that bevel angle. The other way that you can do this, this other tool I brought here, it's going to kind of be second verse, same as the first. I'll bring it right out here, Chris, to the same spot. This is a slow speed grinder. Most grinders run at um, 3,450 RPM. This one runs at half that. That's really important because that lower speed lets us put a finer wheel on. If you are on a high speed grinder using a 80 grit wheel you're grinding not sharpening and grinding is good for shaping but it's not fine enough to get it the sharpness we want to be for our chisel so here on this wheel freehand i'm going to just roll the chisel through same deal keeping that bevel flat on the wheel roll it back in this case, what I can do is I can look down at the top and see the bevel flat on the wheel, make the cut. I can't do the skew on here because there's no great way to get that big flat bevel onto that round wheel. So I still would do this, excuse me, do the skew on a whetstone or something like the work chart. Um, but low speed grinder is a great way to go very, very fast, let you get back to your turning quickly. Um, roughing, a chisel for roughing, the one that I had in my hands, so here's a profile for you. I'm going to set it over here, Krista, so that you can, so I can move stuff. 
That chisel is called a roughing gouge. That's only for spindle work. You would not use that on a bowl, but that will take a spindle from octagonal or square to round very quickly. On a bowl, you might do your roughing with a scraper or with a bowl gouge. Okay. Thank you, George. And just a reminder for anybody who has just tuned in, I'm here with George Von Driska, the managing editor at Woodworkers Guild of America. We're giving away an Erlex sprayer. Go out to Facebook uh, to sign up for that. Drawing is tomorrow, so you have a little time. Um, and we're taking your questions live. We have a lot coming in. Uh, viewers are saying that the audio and the video is much better. Yay! Um, yeah, and we've got people viewing from Scotland, Australia, no Austria. So that's quite interesting. Canada, you know, all over the state. So that's really cool. All yeah. right. So. And Shiva's here today. Did everybody see Shiva the bench dog? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'll get the dog and you can load up on a question. Okay. Um, so we have a couple questions coming in tonight about, <laughs> about temperatures. So I've got this one. Um, it's from somebody living in Texas. Uh, they've got a lot of heat, and uh, Roy has never been able to, let me see, I'm sorry. Um, Roy has never been able to get a reasonable finish with shellac due to the rapid drying oh, because of no. the heat. Do you have any alternatives or suggestions for alternatives? Yes. Um, high heat flashes too quickly. I think if you thin it a little bit, I had the same problem with lacquer. And the, the what was happening was I was spraying lacquer with a turbine HVLP. The turbine creates heat, so the air coming through the turbine was um, warm. So that was causing the lacquer to flash quicker than it otherwise would have. So I thinned the lacquer by about 20% with lacquer thinner and that allowed the finish to flow out much better. So I'm gonna say uh, the solvent for shellac is denatured alcohol. I would try running it a little bit thinner. Um, you're gonna have to do more coats to get the build that you want, um, but I would do it, um, I'd apply it, I would thin the material and see if that lets you flow it out better. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, Steve is asking, and I, I can't understand her, but Steve is saying he has a new Supermax 1936? 1936? 1938. 19, okay, 38, it says 36. Drum sander. He's having problems loading his sanding sheets on the drum. Oh. Can you demonstrate, yeah. please? Any tricks would be greatly so appreciated. Everybody's got to applaud Krista on this one because we're going to ask her to move the camera, the laptop, the extension cord, and the Ethernet cable like 25 feet in the other direction. So, and you got to end up on this side like looking over my shoulder on this machine. Okay, now let's see how this goes. Hmm. Mike, too close to you. And hopefully it's, um, oh no, it's perfect. We can get you like high enough to see. They're gonna kind of need to see down in just a little bit. Oh, we have a dog following. Okay. All right. That looks great. Okay. All right. So here's with these machines. Because we have drums, a wide belt sander literally has a huge belt going from here up to a drive up above it. With these, um, the way it works is that the abrasive spirals onto the head. Like so. This is a 25 inch machine. Steve, what are you saying? Steve has got a 19 inch machine. The premise will be the same, but the roll of sandpaper is going to be shorter. So let me show you. You can stay where you are. I know right where my temple is. So one of the things I did is I found out um, with the owner in the owner's manual for this machine, there was a thing, that, a layout that said, the right angle for this piece is so long. Um, in other words, it, it allowed me to establish what that angle is. I laid that angle out on this piece of plywood and cut it. 
I trace this onto my abrasive rolls when I'm going to cut my pieces. This number, 139 and a quarter, is the length of pieces for this machine. They'll be shorter for your machine. So one, the lesson out of that is you got to be really careful about making sure these are the right length or you will never get it on here correctly. Typically on these machines, the clip on the left side is only a clip that's going to hold the abrasive in place. Can I see the clip? Uh, well. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. So if you stay there a second. And then it's always kind of a hit or miss on the first application. How far should the sandpaper go in? And of course, if I put it in too far, I won't have enough to reach the other end. If I don't put it in far enough, I'll have too much when I get to the other end. So I'm gripping it and then rolling it to let the abrasive wrap. And I'm pulling pretty hard here to keep tension on it. Now, if you can get here, Chris, of the gap between the two. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have a gap. I'm probably blocking you. Yeah. It's okay to have a gap. It is not okay to have an overlap. The gap can be up to about a sixteenth of an inch or so. So I'm working that as I go. Now when I get to the other end, the clip is different. It, it grabs the paper in the same way, but on the other end of these, this clip is spring-loaded. So what happens is that when I reach under here on this end, I'm going to pull the clip up toward the head. And I was just teaching this to my son the other day, and he really struggled with it because it's, it's a little tough to get past the learning curve. But once you can feel where everything is, then it's pretty easy. I pull up on that clip, insert the sandpaper, and then you got to release the clip before you let the spring tension pull the paper back down. If you just let go, sometimes the spring will push it down, and then the clip will grab somewhere toward the bottom, and you don't have quite the spring tension. The idea with the spring is, one, it's applying tension to the paper, two, as this cloth back paper stretches, it helps take up some of the difference so that it doesn't come loose. I find that brand new piece on here after a pass or two, I'm gonna come in and check the belt right away because it stretches a little bit. I don't wanna take a chance that it allows it to overlap because that'll really mess up the paper. Um, it is, it's just a practice thing. Um, at this point, um, before I had this, I had a Performax, so I've been loading paper in this style for quite a while. Um, so it's fairly uh, muscle memory for me at this point. Um, so just keep practicing with it and you'll get it right. Um, we've got some clips on WWGOA. We had Warren Weber from Supermax was in the shop. And I believe if you go on WWGOA and you, in the upper right hand corner, the search window, you search Supermax, I think Warren talks about uh, loading the paper and some tips for getting the paper. Okay, thank you very much, George. So um, we have a question here from Herb, or Herb, I'm never sure how to say it. Um, he is wondering, um, he made a plate with his CNC machine, right? Um, and he used white Corian. Corian. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, it turned out not too bad. But there were some plain spots where it looks like, um, is there any, yeah, so there were some plain spots. So it looks like he kind of wanted to paint it white where okay. maybe it was coming through. Do you have any suggestions for the type of paint he ought to use? Boy, that's, um, so you do a commercial, Kristen, I'm going to get, Okay. Uh, I'll be right back. Perfect. So commercial break. We're here with WWGOA's managing editor, George Vondriska, and our special guest star today, although she's not doing much. It's Sheba. Are you going to do anything? You're going to look there and sit there and look sad. Anyways, um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. If you haven't signed up for the Erlax uh, sprayer, go out to Facebook. That drawing is tomorrow. So you want to sign up for that. If you don't get our newsletters, go ahead and sign up for that as well. Uh, we're here to answer your questions. We have tons of questions coming in. Right. So we're trying to get to all of them. Krista's saying I got to go faster. All right, here we go. That's right. Herb was asking about Corian. Corian is in the family of solid surface countertop. These are examples of that. It's a 
man-made material. It's amazing as a countertop. If you can find a shop where you can get scraps of this stuff, um, it's pretty cool. So I think my, sus my suspicion is Herb maybe didn't have a piece that looked like this with a grain pattern. Maybe he had something that looked like this. So after things were cut, there was a little bland. Um, the question being then, can I paint it? And I'm going to have to defer to a paint store like a Sherwin-Williams or someplace like that. Um, the problem with this man-made stuff is it's so smooth. It has like no porosity or very little. I think it'd be pretty hard to get paint to stick. Um, so I would check with a professional paint supply and see um, what they recommend if there's something that would go on here. Okay. And we actually have another CNC question that came in from Robbie. He wants to know what software to use in CNC routing. So I'm going to say I'm going to do this. What software do you use on your CNC? Most of them use software from Vectric um, and the VI, V E C T R I C. That Vectric software um, is where you do the, the design. And then, depending on what machine you have, it's what's called post processing. Um, you output it through a different post processor, whether you have a Laguna or ShopBot or Next Wave or General, or depending on whose machine you have. It's not unlike um, doing your work on Word but then using a different driver to get it to a printer because it's a Canon or a Sharp or a Sony or whatever. So Vectric software is very prevalent in the C and these benchtop CNC industry. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So Newell is asking a great question. What is the best way to do a chopping block or end grain cutting board? And what would you use to finish it? when all glued together and done. And I actually even know the answer to this. Right. You go ahead. So way back by the red door is an end grain cutting board. Um, well, you know what, what's closer, Krista? There's some, okay, go ahead. Uh, end grain cutting board, uh, other red door, sorry. Um, end grain cutting board, the way to put it together is you glue together strips. And we do have this as a project on WWGOA. You glue together strips long ways as though you're making a conventional cutting board. So edge to edge to edge to edge to edge to edge. After that glue is dry, then we cross cut those and the grain was going long ways. We cross cut those. We take each of the individual pieces, stand it up, glue it. Thank you. Then face to face to face. So now the, End grain was going this way. Now we've stood it up, glued it back together face to face so that we get something that looks like this. For finish, I always use mineral oil on these. And what I do is I want to make sure I've got complete saturation. So remember, this is end grain. So I'll stand this up on painter's pyramids and I'll apply mineral oil to the top until I can see it start to weep out the bottom. That tells me I've got good saturation. Wipe the excess off, flip it over, couple coats on the other side, you're gonna be done. Don't use a vegetable oil, olive oil, anything like that, because it'll go rancid over time on the cutting board. Uh, mineral oil is available at pharmacies because it's also a laxative, but that's not a problem for the way we're using it here. Um, another alternative I like a lot, a friend of mine is a beekeeper, AJ Moses, one of our writers, um, and he'll give me beeswax. And if you heat up mineral oil, you can melt the beeswax into it in a proportion of about 50-50. And that gives you a thicker mix to apply. Part of the downside of the just pure mineral oil is that it takes a lot of it. Um, when you go with that thicker product, it's actually in this toolbox. Oh, um, thought you were looking for the beeswax mix. Um, when you go with the beeswax mix, um, because it's thicker, it doesn't soak in as much, so it doesn't take so long to get the thing sealed but it still provides a good cover. Yes. Thank you. And that we do have a couple of other questions actually specifically related to cutting boards. Individuals are wanting to know what kind of glue to use for them since no glues can really be too like saturated in water, which I don't know why you would want to put your wood cutting board like saturated. I have one. I just wipe it off. So, but anyways, that's why I brought you that glue because I'm okay. awesome. Very good. 
and it is the correct glue because mm -hmm. um, you've seen this you this ain't your first rodeo um i use type on three so in the world of water resistance water proficity we've got two choices type on two is water resistant type on three is waterproof both of the glues are fda approved which makes them good choices for cutting boards for me I default to the Type Bond 3 because it's waterproof. It's got a little higher heat resistance than Type Bond 2 does. Um, and it's just, I'm buying a little extra insurance that way. I do think it's important if you sell or give away any cutting board, end grain or regular, that you tell people you can't put it in the dishwasher, you shouldn't be saturating it with water. Um, even though we've used a waterproof glue, um, it, it just should not be getting that soaking wet. It's just not good for it. Um, but Type Bond 3 is my glue choice for cutting boards. Thank you. Uh, Hank says he noticed that your 14-inch jet bandsaw has a 4-inch dust port added. Could you tell him a little bit about it? He's got uh, the same bandsaw, but he's having some problem with dust collection with what comes with it. Okay, we're going to make Crystal walk again. Let's go this way. We're going to head to that end. You need a uh, gaffer to handle your cables. I'm going to get ahead of you here and get the cables. All right. So Hank's asking about this bandsaw. And if you get... <laughs> People are telling us to ask the dog for help. Wait a second. I'd like to show you guys something. Sorry. Ask the dog for help. That she's she's Can at her optimal something? right there. She's she's doing it. Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. All right, if you can get down here under the table. Uh, so this, I'm gonna turn a little bit. This duct taped over gizmo, this is the dust shroud that came on this bandsaw. What Hank is asking about is this dust port over here. This was cut in. This is a four inch flange connection that you can get from woodworking specialty stores. You can find them online. So what happened on this door was a hole was simply cut in the door. Here, there you go. A hole was cut in the door that flange was screwed to the outside. This assembly, this setup gives me so much, much, so much more airflow on this bandsaw, that's why this one is taped over. So very simple to do, significantly increases the dust collection ability on the bandsaw. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Wonderful. All right, so um, we actually have quite a few questions about joiners. A lot of people are asking how to set them up. Um, they're having some problems with the setup. They're having some problems okay. joining. So maybe we could okay. look okay. at that. Okay. Sorry if I'm not saying all your names out loud, but we've got a lot of them coming in. So. It's funny how they cycle I like know. that. Like I know. one one week there'll be 15 questions all about joiners. So Krista's really good at like scanning them and then finding similarities so that instead of answering similar question 15 times, we try to hit it once. All right. So what's the? Is there kind of a? Is there a symptom people are talking about to help focus this a little bit or what? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I can, I can talk for a couple minutes and then maybe if I'm not giving people what they want, they can let me know. I think that's a good idea right, because so, we've got a lot of things different, how to set it up, things aren't joining right, right they're getting issues. So let's issues. do, let me unplug and if you can get right where that red guard is. So joiners unplugged so we can kind of look at the mechanism here. And I'm on it. Uh, I think you need to, if you could come in just a little bit so you're a little more over the top. There you go. That'll do it. All right. The way a joiner has to be set up to work is that we have an outfeed table and an infeed table. Again, the machine's unplugged. The outfeed table has to be even with the top dead center of the rotation of the knives. The infeed table just a little bit below, a little bit being a 32nd or a 16th of an inch. If we don't have the relationship between the outfeed table and the knives right, we won't get a good cut. What I'm going to do, you stay where you are, and I'm going to intentionally lower the outfeed table 
and you might be able to see that happen. And then you can go ahead and back out and we'll make a cut. And I'm going to flip back in. Grab my ears. Now normally I'm, I'm edge jointing a piece of walnut that's rough two faces. Normally I would face joint first to get a good face. That face would go against the fence before I did an edge. But I didn't have a piece laying here that was ready, so we're going to go ahead and use this one. That chunk that you heard was, I can hold this still for Christy, right here at the end of the board is what's called a snipe. So a snipe is an overcut. This is straight, 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 right there and dives off. And this part is a good 16th lower than this part. That tells me the outfeed table was too low. Now. You're going to see or read about people using dial indicators and straight edges and stuff to bring that table to the right setup. I prefer to just do it symptomatically. Right now we know it's too low, so let's raise the output there. Make another cut. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to make a cut. If it still snipes, I'm going to raise the table. If it still snipes, I'm going to raise the table. We're going to raise the table until the snipe stops. We're snipe hunting. Mm. Raise the table until the snipe stops. A good question would be, what if I go too far if I get the table too high? If you get it really too high, let me go there. Way too high. You can't continue the cut because as I move forward, the end of the board just go... Uh, Tilt down just a little bit, if you would, Christy. Thank you. The end of the board is hitting the outfeed table. Now, it can happen that the outfeed table is only a tiny bit too high, and if that's the case, the board will actually climb up on it. The symptom you're going to get then is you don't have a straight edge. You can actually joint a bow, a uh, concave, into your edge if the, ta if the outfeed table is too high. So what you want, that's why my preference is start with the too low in tiny, tiny increments, come up, come up, come up. Right when the snipe disappears, you're done. Don't turn that hand wheel anymore because then you might get the table too high, the offy table too high. That's exactly what they say about snipe hunting. What? Once you see the snipe, it's done. Once you see the snipe, it's all done. The hunt is over. That's right. All right, so we have a couple questions here about finishing. Um, is there a preference when making furniture, so say like a kitchen table or a dresser, to applying finish with a brush versus spraying the finish on? Well, if you win the Erlex sprayer on the <laughs> WWGOA Facebook page, you'll always spray finish from here on out. If, if you have the facility to spray, I kind of don't care what the project is, I would spray it. Uh, you know, the exception being... Maybe the project is so small you don't want to take the time to clean your gun, but 
um, kitchen table, dresser, chairs, anything that you can spray. If you have the ability to spray it, spray it. Um, finishes have to be compatible with that. Some finishes spray better than others, but uh, if you can spray and not hand wipe or hand brush, do it. All right, thank you. So we have Mark asking, he's considering buying a table saw for his small garage shop. He's looking at either a contractor saw or a hybrid saw. Is there an advantage to buying the hybrid saw over the contractor saw? Dust collection. Cool. Hey, that was an easy one. Quick and fast. So I, I like that. If a, a contractor, the guts of a contractor saw and a hybrid saw are pretty similar. Generally, they both run on 110 volts, so they're plug and play. You don't need special wiring. Um, the difference, what they did is they took the guts of a contractor saw and put it inside a cabinet, like a cabinet saw would have. Um, really the, the biggest complaint against contractor saws historically has been there's no good way to trap the dust. Um, so hybrid saws do a good job of speaking to that. Um, so two things, I mentioned the Airlex sprayer, jump on the Facebook page and sign up for that contest, WWGOA Facebook, we're giving that away tomorrow, so you got to get on there. And then two, I would love to hear again, video quality, audio quality, to see if the changes we made are having a positive effect. All right. Joe wants to know, is D-Wax shellac better than pre-stained conditioner? Uh, yeah, I, I use, I use D-Wax shellac as my substrate all the time. It's my sanding sealer under anything, lacquer or polyurethane, whatever my top coat is. It's also my conditioner if I'm going to stain a piece of wood and I want to precondition. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't, Sorry, Chris is giggling in the background. She really loves that joke about shellac. No. Um, I, I'm not ready to say it's better. I'm sure wood conditioner has some attributes. Um, but shellac is always in my shop because I use it so much. Um, the, the Zinsser Seal Coat. So um, for me, it's it's the go-to product. Brad wants to know, George, your shop is very clean. This is why I was laughing. As a general rule, do you clean your shop at the end of your daily shop time? Do you clean it once a week or do you clean it just prior to your video conference? Uh, I'm going to plead the fifth on this and not answer for fear of incriminating myself. Uh, so thank you for the compliment. Um, generally what happens for me is I'm kind of frenetic in my work. I'm really good at setting stuff down and not necessarily putting it away. So usually, uh, yeah, Chris is already nodding in agreement. Um, so generally, um, immediately before a video shoot or these live things, um, I have to do a lot of putting it away, a lot of putting away and a lot of cleaning to get it to look like it does now. But I will say my dust collection is better here than it was at my old shop. Um, the floors here are concrete with asphalt tile over them. So they're much easier to clean than the plywood floors in my old shop. So all of that really facilitates keeping it cleaner too. Great, thank you. Uh, Gary wants to know, on your how to cut full blanks from logs, okay, you include the pith in the blank. He was taught that including any of the pith and especially all of the pith would greatly increase the probability of the green bowl warping and splitting. Is this true or false? Thank you. Should I stay or should I go? So let's get pithy. Here's a, there's a natural rim bowl cut from pine, I think. Um, so pith, uh, yeah, I could get that one. Uh, go ahead and stay on this one. Oh, are you going to be able to reach that? There's a stool right here, Krista, you just passed. Um, the pith that we're talking about here is right here, the very center of the tree. If, I, if the bowl blank I want is basically the entire log, I'm going to include the pith. Is there a chance it can get a little funky? Maybe. So as I feel this, the, the bowl itself has gone egg-shaped. It's no longer round as it dried. Additionally, the pith is kind of sticking out further than the rest of it. Doesn't, excuse me, doesn't bother me. I think that's a cool natural byproduct of turning these natural bowls. This is a piece of box elder. Um, this has got a lot of stuff going for it. And actually, I, I saw when I looked at the bottom of this one, this one's also box elder. This is box elder that had this beautiful pink in the grain. So on this one, this was the pith. And you can see 
it fell right out. I'm okay with that. Um, if you're having a log and you're doing a section of it and you can eliminate the pith, you're right. It's it's going to be uh, keeping it included is going to make it more prone to having something go wrong. Um, but uh, obviously, from these bowls, don't be afraid by about including it if you need to. Thank you very much. And I just want to remind everybody that I'm here with George Vodriska, managing edit editor for WWGOA Woodworkers Guild of America. Go on out there, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, sign up for the Erlach Sprayer on Facebook if you haven't to win it. The drawing is tomorrow. I'm sure all our loyal listeners are tired of these commercials, but where are we at on time? We got about ten minutes left. Okay. We have tons of questions. Ten minutes, twenty in. questions. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of comments on the audio and video being much better, so Great. that's really good. Um, we have a question from a viewer. Watcher, if you can help them figure out how close they need to put their fence on the table saw to the wood when they're cutting it. I think that means like, where do you set the fence to make the cut? All right, okay. well, let's walk over there, but I'm not sure I get if they're what? Who is it? Name of the submitter? Um, I'll have to look because it went away. Carl. Carl, if you can. Uh, oh wait, this is not the table. So I'm sorry. This is the router. My bad. Router table. I would like to know how to figure out how far I should set the fence for my piece of wood using the router. So maybe router table. I don't know. Okay, I'll go yeah, to a different question. I'm still. I'm still. Well, so here's with a handheld router um, or a router table. If there's a bearing on the bit, that's going to control also where the fence goes on a router table. Because commonly you're going to line up the face of the fence with the bearing. Never, ever, 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 ever have a bearing, a, a router bit, the fence over here, and then pass in between them. It's very dangerous. You always have the bit, the fence capturing it, and then you're passing along the face of the fence to produce the profile. So hopefully, Carl, that gets you where you need to go. Okay, thank you. Um, George, is there a good finish for things like kitchen tables? We've got a lot of questions like that coming in. It's uh, If it's a high use thing, I mean, I'm a big fan of lacquer on a lot of furniture, but um, for stuff like tables, you can't beat polyurethane. Uh, high water resistance, high alcohol resistance, a little bit some heat resistance. Um, so it's, it's a good, if you're kind of plasticizing the surface. Thank you. Uh, Wesley would like to know, how do you know how much glue to apply to prevent excess squeeze out? And we have had a couple other viewers ask. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty subjective. And I think it has to do a lot with your application method. So if you want to, I'll talk for a second. I don't care what glue you get. And then there's a, in the glue cabinet, there's an old coffee can full of brushes. Um, and maybe just bring the whole can and I'll pick something out of there. Um, so let's get, I'm going to get a dark piece of wood so you can see the glue. So what I recommend to students is that glue gets applied in much the same way that you would paint. Well, I'm just going to kind of do the hot top half here so you don't have to worry about seeing the whole thing. I really like these silicone brushes. Um, Rockler was one of the first companies to make them. I've seen a other, couple other companies with them lately. Um, silicone being when the glue dries on there, you can just break it all off later. What I'm looking for as I spread this is, like I said, I want to treat this kind of like I'm painting a wall. What that means is that there's enough glue on here that I can no longer see the wood beneath the glue, but I don't have big drips running down it either, just like you wouldn't want drips on a wall that you're painting. If I'm doing an edge to edge glue up, only one of the two edges gets glue on it. The other one stays raw, close the joint. If I'm doing a mortise and tenon, the glue goes in the mortise, no glue on the tenon, close the joint. So, and I'm generally only gluing half of the, applying glue to half of the joint. And that also helps not get excessive squeeze out. Uh, with that being said, on an edge-to-edge -edge glue up, cutting board we were talking about earlier, when you close that joint, you should see a few beads of glue come out of there to know that you have enough glue in there, but you shouldn't see a gallon of glue come out of it. 
Perfect, thank you. And we do have a couple um, follow-up questions from earlier today. We have a viewer who was wondering if you could just give the names again of the two machines you used for uh, sharpening the chisels. Okay, so the first one I used is a work sharp. Um, good job. Um, and I don't know if it's worksharp.com or not, but um, home centers have them. Um, a lot of woodworking specialty stores have them. There are a couple different models available. This one is, I think it's the 3000, the WorkSharp. Yep, it's the WorkSharp 3000. The other one, you just gonna zoom from there. Slow speed grinder. You're probably not gonna find this. I don't know if they can hear me this far away. Um, you're probably not gonna find that at a home center. You're gonna have to go to a woodworking specialty item. If you Google slow speed grinder, you'll find it. Okay, great, thank you so much. And Roger would actually like to hear a little more information about what you said about your asphalt floor tiles covering your concrete. Cool. There they are. There they are. Uh, they were in here when I bought the building. This this was a county library at one point, which is like sexier than it, it sounds sexier than it really is. It's kind of a pole shed that used to be a county library. Um, but it's concrete, went down first, Asphalt tile over the top. For me, it's been wearing very well. And as I said, boy, is it easy to sweep. I throw a little sweeping compound down and then I just run a, uh, I don't actually sweep. I run a dust mop over the whole thing. The, the sweeping compound helps grab the fine stuff. I've actually got a Hoover floor mate. Um, when I'm highly motivated, I wash the floor with a Hoover floor mate. Okay. And George, we have a lot of questions today about the website. And I know we talked about this before that there's a customer service number because we don't run the website that's run through somebody else. So do you have that number or are you able to post it for people who are having a hard time navigating or finding things on Yeah, the we'll post it. So what Chris is talking about is Woodworkers Guild of America is a big entity. Um, so there are people, customer service people who specifically field questions. Um, there are people who specifically set up and run the website within Woodworkers Guild of America. Um, so um, we will, in the responses to the live, once it's archived, we'll get that information posted there. And that's the best route to go. You know, if you're having trouble logging in with your membership or anything like that, um, go straight to customer service with that because I'm not a much of a computer guy. And also if they're having problems locating things, right? Well, plans yeah. and I mean, if you're looking for content, the, my best advice is upper right hand corner. The best kept secret on the website is there's this window that's about this big and it's a search window. And we do we work very hard and I am involved in this on tagging the content with a variety of tags so that um, it makes it user friendly for searching. So you can search dovetail, mortise and tenon data, whatever. So do those keyword searches in the upper right hand corner and you'll get a page or two of results that'll help sort that information out. Use that, use that search window like an index to help you find specifically what you're looking for. We do, we do work very hard to tag all the content. Right, right. And then we'd like to remind everybody too, we're doing new, some new technology. It sounds like the audio and uh, video are much better but we do have a lot of people asking questions you know that we have addressed before so these are broad these are archived so you can go out and find these other lives and get answers to some of these questions um so i think we only have like a minute left and we have tons of questions we didn't get to so and to be and to be fair to krista and i guess myself too we we go into this with over 100 questions and then how many more we get another 50 or more come in tonight so we do what we can go ahead so i'm thinking maybe for the last question we have a lot of people again who are beginner woodworkers and they're just wondering you know what should they invest their money in for beginning woodworkers to get tools do you, you know we've had this question before but we have a lot again tonight so perhaps we could address that okay um very soon we're going to have an article posted by paul mayer which is um, spending your first thousand dollars in woodworking tools, um, or that's kind of the working title. Um, I just edited the manuscript today. Um, it's hard for people, really no woodworker is going to argue that a table saw is going to be very much at the top of the list because of its versatility. 
Um, from there, woodworkers can get into a lot of different discussions. Router table, uh, which lends itself to the router coming out and being used handheld as well. So a lot of versatility there. Um, and portable tools, a random orbit sander, um, stationary tools, a belt sander, I'm sorry, a bandsaw. If you don't want to pull the trigger on something as big as a bandsaw, a handheld jigsaw can do a lot of the curve work for you. Um, just doesn't quite have the thickness capacity that a bandsaw has. So um, nobody's going to argue with table saw, like I said, but from there, it really, you got to think about what kind of woodworking you're going to do, what direction you want to go. Um, but table saw, handheld router, random orbit sander, jigsaw is a great start until you're ready for router table, jointer, bandsaw, some of those tools. We've got a video on the site that's George's choice for five, the top five tools. Um, but again, it's pretty subjective stuff. My top five might not be Paul Mayer's top five. Okay, thanks George. So we're out of time. We wanna thank everybody for viewing. We're gonna try and do this again, correct? We're hoping for monthly. We're hoping for once a month, so join us. And the other thing I'd like to say to everybody is the questions, right? George does go through these afterwards, right? And you respond to as many questions as you can that are woodworking related. I'd like to say that because we've had a lot come in about electric stuff and, uh, you know, just not woodworking related. But if it's woodworking related, you do go through and you do answer the questions. So even if we didn't get to them, you know, post them on there and we'll answer them, right? Yeah, I try to get to them in the next 24 hours. And I want to speak again to the point Krista made. Um, there, we're, we draw the line between woodworking and home improvement. So questions about fixing a countertop, replacing shashes on windows, repairing a deck, replacing an entry door. That's just not what we do. So um, anything else from you? Because I got to tell my pet St. Patty's. Oh, gosh. Uh, no, I guess I get to hear this joke along with everyone else. Okay. Sorry, so guys. my favorite St. Patrick's Day joke um, is, what is the name of the Irishman who always lives outside. And I wish I could do, the, the it'd be so much better if I could do a brogue, but I won't even bother trying. You ready? So the name of the Irishman who always lives outside is Patio Furniture. Thanks, George. Everybody night, out Gracie. there is groaning. You can roll your eyes. <laughs> All right, so uh, what was the response? Oh my God. All right. <laughs> All right, so Krista's going to close us, and then we're going to shut down the live. And uh, thanks for coming. Glad it was better. Thanks, Krista, for the great camera work. Yep, see you guys.